Hey, good morning. Uh, so glad you're here. Welcome to those who are worshiping the chapel this morning. Of course, those who are worshiping at Pleasant View. Uh, great seeing some of you on Friday night. Uh, great opportunity to be together as a church family. So uh, I'm going to start with a word of prayer and then share with you what's on my heart. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for these incredible people and just the high honor of being able to uh, sort of break the word of life together and for us to listen to your spirit uh, at work in our lives as you talk to us individually, as you talk to us corporately. And so because of that important task, Lord, I ask you to begin the work now. I pray that you'd prepare our hearts right now. Any, anything that we have that we're carrying with us that sort of is distracting, any barriers, any, any attitudes or inappropriate thoughts, whatever they might be, I pray you would rise above all that and make our hearts fertile soil for the words that follow. Uh, because I truly believe, Lord, that these words that follow can actually change lives. And so hide me deep, deep in your empty cross in order that you would receive all the glory in your name. Amen. So grateful for those who helped us kind of get started in the, whole, in the whole series on Ruth. And I'm especially grateful I have the opportunity to actually speak on Ruth. And so I get to do that for the next couple of weeks before we, I think, jump into the next series or whatever it is. And the reason I'm excited about speaking to you about Ruth is Ruth is one of these one of these gems of Hebrew literature. And I, I'm going to go all Bible geek on you this morning, okay, for a little bit. So just get over it. So it's just part of what excites me. But Ruth is simply stunning as far as when you start reading he, uh, Hebrew literature. And what I'm going to try to do to keep you engaged in this, at least the introduction, is I'm going to do it by the numbers. I'm going to show you the numbers of why I think Ruth is incredible. And so you are going to be excited about this. Okay, yeah, so we're going to be excited about this. I saw everybody cracked open their notebooks to start taking notes right now. Okay, but it, it, trust me, this is really exciting. And so here, let me tell you, the, tell you this. So uh, Ruth is actually one of two books in all of Scripture that's named after a woman. I know, it blows my mind too. Isn't that stunning? Anybody want to know, what, anybody guess the other book? Esther, very good, that's right. And you're like, what Bible? Okay, those are Esther. Esther is the other book, that's right. How about this one? 1,400. So 1400 is that period of time when Ruth was supposedly dropped or was released from the printing press or whatever the case might be. And that's a big deal because 1400 BC was the period of the judges. And that was a dark, dark day for the people of Israel. It was, it was everything that could go wrong went wrong, and the country was being led by a bunch of weirdos, which we can all relate to. And so that was kind of going on. That was, that's not a political statement. It's just fact. So we were all sort of excited about that. And, and the judges, they went through that same thing. But right in the middle of this chaos, Ruth drops. And Ruth is stunning. Ruth is amazing. So everybody was excited about the story of Ruth. 23. Get it, keep this in mind. Ruth is in the Old Testament. But get this. There are 23 different times in the book of Ruth where some form of the word redeemer occurs. Redeemer, guys, we don't start using that language till we get in the New Testament, but Ruth, 23 times it occurs, some form of that word. Three, these are the main characters in the book of Ruth. There's only three characters, four if you include God. And every chapter sort of summarizes a character or a different event in the character's life. So you got Ruth, and you got Boaz, and you got Naomi, and you have God. That's the whole entire book. It's amazing. Are you not on the edge of your seat right now? I mean, is this not incredibly exciting? Okay. So uh, two, you all have forgot how to listen while I've been gone. I can see that. So two, two, what does that mean? I have no idea. Let me look at that. So, so two, no, actually, I do remember. Two has to do with the second king of Israel. Let me tell you this. Look at this. Ruth ends up being the great-grandmother of King David. You know David and Goliath, dude, you know, with the sling, slingshot and all that? And David, Psalm 23, and um, David and Bathsheba, you remember all that? That King David, Ruth is actually his great-grandmother. Isn't that amazing? Listen to this, listen to this, 220. So if you decide, and I'm really going Bible geek on you, but if you open your scripture to the book of Ruth and you go almost to the dead middle, you will find chapter 2, verse 20. And Ruth is written like this. It is written, bad news, 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 bad news. 2.20. I have you on the edge of your seat right now. Do I not? Isn't that amazing? You're saying, please, Tom, make the finger go back up. Please, please. 
Good news, good news, good news, good news. It's called point of cruciality when you're studying scripture. At 2.20, everything changes. From there, it's bad news. 2.20, everything changes. Say, what's 2.20 say? I'm not going to tell you. But I will tell you later. I'm going to tell you later, so I'm coming back to that. Check this out. This is perhaps what I think. This is really Bible geek, but this is so incredible. Listen to this. At the beginning of the book of Hebrew, of the book of Ruth, there are 71 words used to introduce the book in, in, in the original Hebrew. 71 words. And they talk about the problem Naomi and Ruth find themselves in. At the end of the book of Ruth, there are 71 words that are used to describe how the whole thing changed. So 71 words of despair, 71 words of incredible hope. Is that not stunning? Isn't that amazing? I just really wish we all were kind of more aware and we could all understand it, including myself, a bit more about this. So let me just share with you the first, first 71 words. This is Ruth chapter 1. And beginning with verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. So you can stop right there. Anytime the judges did something, it, in the spirit of judges, there was a bad news happening. So there's famine in the land in the book of Judges. And that was sort of the cycle they were all stuck in. Do you remember? So like the judges would say, okay, we're going to follow God. Then they'd say, ah, I'm tired of God. So they'd do something different. They'd misbehave or they'd go through some kind of trial. And so then they'd repent. They'd say, Lord, please, can you get us out of this? And then God would raise up a judge. And like Samson or Gideon or someone would come and say, you know, okay, I'll get you out of this. And then they'd start that cycle all over again. So this is what happens in the book of, in the book of Judges. There's famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem and Judah together with his wife and two sons went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Beth kind of went into that last week. That's a bad decision. You have Jewish people going to a place where they are not loved, and they don't love Moab, Moab, Moabites. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malian and Kilian. I'm absolutely sure that's how you say that. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left for her two sons. You follow me? We're getting there, right? They married Moabite women. Also a bad decision. One was named Orpah. Whoever came up with that name, bad decision. If that's your name, I'm sorry. I mean, because I'm sure you were picked on as a kid, but Orpah is a weird name. Don't ever name your kid. You folks that like to get creative with naming your children, don't go with Orpah, okay? Don't do Orpah. And the other, Ruth. After they'd lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and without her husband. This is bad news. But then, 71 words at the end of the book go like this. This is toward the end. Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. Good news. The first one, there's famine in the land. The end, Boaz took Ruth to be his wife. Do you see what happened? Bad news, good news. They, then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to her son. See, famine in the land, everybody's dying. Now we got babies. This is wonderful. And the women said to Naomi, praise be the Lord who this day has left you, has not... Uh, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. There's that word. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Get this. Then Naomi took the child. Look at this beautiful picture. Laid him in her lap and cared for him. The whole beginning of the book Everybody's dying. Husband died. Two boys die. Laid the new kid in the lap, and she cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. In my mind, also not a good name, but nonetheless. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is an amazing little book. And part of it, besides all the Hebrew geek stuff that I just shared with you, the other part about that makes this book so amazing is the happy ending. It's an incredible ending to a book. Boaz gets the girl, Ruth gets her husband, Naomi gets her grandson, and ultimately, the world's going to get a savior. What an incredible story. And I think it's the tension between these two passages, the 71 words that introduce and the 71 words that close. I think it's the tension between those two passages that merits our focus today. Because it is the tension that connects this story to my story and to your story. It's that tension between those two passages. Because everybody in this room, we all know firsthand the tension of living between a problem and a solution, right? Everybody in this room understands what that is like. 
It may be a big problem, maybe a small problem, maybe a problem at work, maybe a problem at home, maybe a problem in relationships, maybe a health problem. But we all understand we live in this tension between problems and solutions. That's what life sort of is. And we are entertained and enthralled and maybe even desperate to learn how problems resolve. And the reason is, we want to know how conflicts go away because the reason is, maybe we would have some hope if, if I can read enough stories, if it can happen in Scripture, if it can happen in your life and my life, if it can happen as I watch a movie, well, then maybe there's hope that it can actually happen for me. You see, it isn't the problem that attracts me to the story of Ruth. It's the solution. If we did the first two chapters, two, two chapter and 20 verses, if we did the first part of that book and it ended, nobody would read the book of Ruth. But what we're attracted to is actually the solutions. Now, problems that we all deal with are often associated with this thing called regret. Words we wish we could unsay. Emails we wish we could unsend. Children we wish would make a different decision. A diagnosis we grieve and, and wish there was another option. Young and old, everybody sort of carries the things we wish we could undo. Sometimes we cause these things. Sometimes the things were caused by someone else at no fault of our own. But we all, humanity holds these things in common. But what some of us have learned, and this is what Ruth just screams at me, the book. A lot of people know what it's like to lose loved ones. But Ruth and Naomi, man, they, they somehow have learned or are learning to move beyond chapters of regret and into chapters of healing and hope and restoration. They're moving from problem to solution. And I'm intrigued by that. I, I'm even drawn to that. Because I love to be around people who are actually moving between problem and solution, moving from problems to solution. Here's the reality. Isn't this true? You don't really want to know the regrets of my life. I mean, that may be exciting for like a moment, but really it's not that exciting. And it wouldn't really distinguish me. What you really want to know is, how have I moved beyond those regrets? And the same is true for me about you. I don't really care what you've done. I don't care about your regret. What I want to know is, what are you doing now? What is God doing in your heart and life now? Your testimony, my testimony, isn't our failures. The testimony is redemption, which leads to this incredible question. Here's the question that I want to go after. What is the code? What is the code that moves us from regret to redemption? What is the thing that we're supposed to be engaging in in our lives that moves us from the problem to solution? What is that? And I'm not talking about a cheap substitute for redemption here. Please hear me. I'm not talking about, oh, I married and that went away. No, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm not talking about I quit drinking and that behavior stopped. That's not a solution. I'm not talking about I got older and I stopped acting like a fool. That's not a solution. I'm not talking about, oh, they moved away, so I don't have to forgive them. <laughs> or they're going to another church now. I don't have to forgive them. I'm not talking about that. That's cheap. I'm not talking about, oh, we're back together now. We're just choosing not to deal with what actually happened. See, my concern is in modern church, I think we sort of replaced redemption with growing old. If the only things that change in our lives are time and circumstances resulting in less opportunity to build regret, then we really haven't changed. And you see this all the time when church people continue to act like they're unchurched. We think because we are older and have jobs and children and responsibilities that we're all good, but we're not. We think because we're back in church, because we have children now, we're good. We think because we don't do things we used to do and we hope our children never find out what we did, we think we're good and we, we end up calling that as redemption. And it is not redemption. In fact, what really scares me is when people start replacing growing old with redemption, people think now that I'm settled and have responsibilities, I must re re be redeemed. What really scares me is when those people end up leading in church world or end up having influence in church world because they're not redeemed. They've just cleaned their own act up, if you will. We're assuming we, if we no longer behave badly, we're righteous, and those are not the same things. We have connected behavior to being righteousness. You know what I'm kind of thinking about these days? Circumstances don't build solid character. Whoever said that was different than me. Circumstances actually reveal character. <laughs> That's what happens. 
Circumstances actually reveal the kind of character we have. In other words, we don't reach middle age and become righteous because we made it through our teens and our 20s. That doesn't happen. See, I want change. I don't just want change in my heart. I want change in your life and my life. I want to see complete change. I want bitter to be changed to pleasant from Mara to back to Naomi. I want lonely to be changed to fulfilled from Ruth alone to Ruth and Boaz. I want regret to be changed to redemption from widowed and foreign to the kinsman redeemer. I want the story of Ruth to be the story of Tom and, and the story of you. Don't you? Kind of. in there part of you that said, that'd be really cool if that was true of me. And so this week what I want to do is I want to, I want to go after the code. And then next week, I'm going to apply the butter to bread and show you that code in incredible action at one of the most dramatic moments in Christian history. So I, I cannot, cannot wait for that, but I'm going to try, to try to not do that today. Before we get to that code, there's one thing I have to kind of set on the table for all of us in this room. And I think it's sort of a lost art in Christian circles, especially if we have bought into the model that being righteous means we've grown old and we've stopped having opportunities to do what we used to do. There's one caveat that we have to do, and this could be the beginning. So I'm sort of laying this out as a foundation. Ruth has a great grandson. His name is David. David's an adulterer, a murderer, and a conniver. He won his first wife in a contest. That didn't work out well, you might, might imagine. He got Bathsheba pregnant, tries to hide it. When he couldn't hide it, he arranged for Bathsheba's husband, who was a loyal soldier of his, to actually be killed on the battlefield. And then he tried to marry Bathsheba to hide the pregnancy. They end up losing the child. And you know what the scripture calls David? A man after God's own heart. <laughs> a man after God's own heart. This is a guy who walked in here, good men of you, wouldn't even talk to him. You certainly wouldn't let your children play with him, right? But the scripture calls him a man after God's own heart. Why? Well, the reason is because David was confronted with his sin by a guy named Nathan. He was the prophet. And as a result of that conversation, David, are you ready? Repented repented, and I've kind of thrown out a new definition for us to think about because I think it's helpful for me, but repentance is to turn. Repentance is to rethink how I think about everything in my heart. In other words, when repentance starts, it's not about behavior modification junk. It's not about I got old, so I stopped sinning. It's not about that. Repentance is I need to rethink how I think about everything, and that results in my heart being changed. And that's what happened in David's life. He repented. See, Scripture teaches an incredible truth that is so convicting to me. So if you don't want conviction, don't listen right now. Just kind of hum a song or look at the person's hair in front of you or whatever, or lack of, whatever it is. You just don't think about what I'm getting ready to say, okay? If you don't want that, don't think about this. So just kind of hum. But here's what Scripture teaches. Much of our regret, all that we do, on the outside is actually an overflow, get this, of what's inside. So let me, let me kind of tell you what that means. Your anger is a result of what's in here. Your pity party is a result of what's in here. Your selfishness. Your attitude towards someone who's made you mad or your attitude towards someone who just cut you off on the road, it's a result of what's in here. Not here. It's a result of what's in here. Your instincts, a result of what's in here. That's been a big one in my life this past couple of weeks. Your, your, your destructive behavior, it's a result of in here. Your gossip, in here. Your desire to be accepted at all cost, it's a result of what's in here. All these are the result of what's going on inside of you. Get this. Your self-righteous arrogance. My self-righteous arrogance. It's in here. It's a result of what's in here. One day some Pharisees come to Jesus. And they're lighting Jesus up because that's what Pharisees do. And they go to Jesus and say, Jesus, we noticed that your disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat which is, of course, gross. But that's kind of what they were saying. They said, and the reason they were saying it wasn't because it was gross. They were saying because you had to wash your hands. It was part of Jewish law. It was part of Jewish law. You do this outside. You make sure these are clean. You let everybody see it. 
and the, and the Pharisees were doing exactly what Christian people do today that discuss, and that is, let's see how righteous they are by whether or not they wash their hands. And Jesus says this, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? I'm going to share with or spare you the actual detail of that, but what you think it is, that's exactly what Jesus said. He would get an email for this sermon, I promise. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. Look at that. Look at that. And sometimes it's so hard for us to see this in ourselves. So so think about your spouse. They really have a problem, don't they? For out of the heart comes evil intention, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander, non-exclusive list. Jesus is pointing the direction. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands, that's not it. So once our heart gets right before God and we're in this position of repentance, once we've invited God into the process of sort of cleaning our hearts, then the code can be formed and we can not only, and then we can, we can not only own the code, but we can live the code. And the code replaces the sin and regret in our hearts. That's what's so exciting to me. What we're getting ready to discover in the next few moments, this replaces the yuck in here. And instead of sin or regret or the problems dictating our lives, the code begins to dictate our lives. And this is monstrous. This is a huge transformation for all Christians who decide to embrace this. So let me share a period of Jesus' life when the personal code was matured and developed. Next week I'm going to show you how how it looks. So Jesus is raised in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth for most of his life, and he's a carpenter, first 30 years of his life. Kind of one time, or one day around the 30-year mark, Jesus goes down to the Jordan River, and there's his cousin down there baptizing people. He's called John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist is what he's called. And here's where the code begins. As soon as Jesus was baptized, you know, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, Heaven was opened. We're headed into the freaky zone. This is a weird thing. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. He goes, caw, caw. That's a crow. But anyway, like a dove and, and, and lighting on him, you know, which, which I had to look that up. It, it landed. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son with whom, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. This is a great day in the life of Jesus. This is amazing. <laughs> Jesus is having a good day. He's been baptized. His heavenly father has identified him as the son of God. He said, that's my boy. And you know what? I noticed this time as I studied the passage, before Jesus did anything, this is so cool. No walking on, no walking on water, no water to wine, no healing lepers, none of that. Before he did anything, did you see what the voice from heaven said? I love this kid. Doesn't that sort of fly in the face of what many of us are sort of raised with? God loves me when I do good things. Nope, he doesn't. Before Jesus does anything, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with this kid. That was a good day. This day ended with Jesus sitting on the front porch listening to the sounds of the night and drinking his coffee. That's, That's a good day. And after this incredible day, Jesus heads out into the wilderness. Day one was good. Next day, not so good. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus is led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. This is day two. No heavenly voice. No river water. No family to do the baptism. No dove flying down and resting on his head or something. No, Jesus is in a lonely place. He's headed to a trying place. And then comes, I think, one of the biggest understatements of all the Bible. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. (laughs) Well, golly, you think? You think that might be so? You think that might be true? You know, thanks for putting that in there for the coolest ones of all of us. That's, That's amazing. Let me memorize that. Fasting 40 days, he was hungry. But you know what? I also get it. Because aren't there times in your life and when God seems really close and other times when he seems like he's lost track of us? Don't you feel that? Aren't there times when when we sort of get frustrated with God and we just cry out, Lord, do you know I'm still here? Do you know I'm still in the middle of this problem season? Why are you so quiet? 
And Jesus went from this really great day to hearing nothing. It was Cricketville. And that's just day two. And day three. And four. That's week one for Jesus. Day one was, yes, I'm the son of God. He's well pleased with me. That's a baptism sound. It wasn't a shotgun. You know, baptism sound. and Then nothing. Not just week one, but week two, week three, week four, and week five. Nothing. Nothing. You don't hear anything. And it went on for weeks. And finally, after weeks of nothing and loneliness, nothing from God, finally Jesus hears a voice. But it's not the voice he thought he was going to hear. The tempter came to him and said, first voices he hears, if you're the son of God, we'll tell these stones here to become bread. Now the devil's going for the jugular here. His language seems to say, you're the son of God, huh? Well, that's real impressive. If you were my son, I wouldn't leave you out here like this to starve. And he tempts Jesus. Why don't you save your own life then? God's obviously not coming. Feed your life. Take care of you. Jesus answers. It's written. Man doesn't live on bread alone. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It took me forever to understand what in the world was going on here. You know what Jesus is being tempted with? I would suggest my relationship with the Heavenly Father is not defined by how I feel right now. My relationship with the Heavenly Father isn't related to my bread or whether or not I have bread. It is something deeper than my circumstances. The code is beginning to form, and it's a code that will change your life, but it will have to replace all that's inside right now for us. So lean in close because we're getting, getting ready to see the code in a different level. The devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of that temple. If you're the son of God, he says it again, he says it all the time. It's what Jesus had just heard from God, this is my son, and then the devil tempts that or, or challenges that. If you're the th- son of God, he said, why don't you throw yourself down? It says he'll command his angels concerning you, and they're going to lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Devil quoting scripture to Jesus, which is really ironic. And Jesus says, well, it's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test, dummy. I don't know if he said that last part, but I just think I would if I was in that circumstances. I just think I would. See, again, Satan goes after the core identity piece, and Jesus responds, listen, I don't run my life like that. I'm going by a different code. I'm not going to run away from God and test him to see if he's going to come after me. Bet you can't catch me. Bet you can't catch me, God. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say, okay, God, I'm going to drive my car into a tree. If you really love me, stop it. God's going to say, you dummy. You know, and I, mean, I don't know. He's not going to say that. He's going to say something loving. But nonetheless, it's not, it's not what you do to God. God, if you really love me, will you get me out of this circumstance? That's not the situation that we're dealing with. That's, that's cheap. And that's sort of what Jesus says. I'm not going to run away from God and see if he'll come after me. I'm not playing games with God. I'm surrendered to God. This isn't a game. It's a relationship. You don't play games with relationships that last. If you start playing games in relationships, those things erode. This code, guys, it's being refined by fire. And you just heard the second part of the code. Now you're getting ready here to the third part. Satan tries one more time. Again, the devil takes him to a very high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and splendor. He says, all this I will give you. And I wonder if that didn't tick God off, but, you know, (laughs) you'll give what? (laughs) But anyway, he said, if you'll bow down and worship, and worship me. So Satan's saying, I'm powerful. I'm in charge. Your heavenly father's lost track of you, but I'm here. He didn't care. He's angry with you. Why don't you just do it yourself? Ever been tempted by that? Yeah, me too. He's distanced himself from you. Jesus speaks one more time. Away from me, Satan. Again, 
actual way that was said, he'd get an email for this one. But away from me, Satan, for it is written. That's not like, be gone, oh Satan. I mean, that, this is imperative. This is like, you know, back the truck up. Kind of, it is intense, whatever you say. Away from me, Satan, for it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Watch this. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Now, friends, we have just observed the refiner's fire that produced a code that Jesus gives us to live a life by. This is the code that moves us all from regret to redemption. The code we cling to in this tension between problem and solution. The code that's to govern the life of true followers of Jesus Christ. The code that changes the heart of what is inside. We have just witnessed our Savior pound out the code in the midst of incredible fire. The code you're looking for in your life, the code I'm longing for in my life, the peace that makes it all worthwhile, the rock-solid foundation that I can build a life on without question, that I can build a marriage on, a family, a sexual identity on, a plan for addiction recovery or a path for that. Uh, This is the code that will restore relationships and disease-defeating kind of code, uh, kind of the humility for self-righteousness sort of code. We've just witnessed the refining code of Jesus that will govern the rest of his life. And here it is for us to choose whether or not we want to have this code in Tom's world or your world. God's my father. God's my father. Come on. If you're the son of God, tell the stones to come bread. I know. I live on every word my father says. My father loves me. He's going to take care of me. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. See if he catches you. I got a loving heavenly father. He's going to take care of me. You can have all this here, all this stuff. I have all the power. Nope. My father's with me. I'm going to worship him and him alone. The number one message of Jesus is this. Ready? I have good news. Not junky news. Not God's mad at you. I have good news. Rethink how you think about everything. Rethink the strategy for your life. God's kingdom isn't something out there. God's kingdom is something available to you now, today. It is here, and you could be different right now. How? Follow the code. Live by the code. And this is the turning point in the book of Ruth from that 220 number I mentioned at the very beginning. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And she added, that man, our close relative, he is one of our kinsmen redeemers. He's the solution to this problem. He's the redemption to our regrets. Boaz and his God will redeem the regrets of Ruth and Naomi and in so doing, point to the redeemer of all humanity. My redeemer, your redeemer, and the solution begins in Ruth's stories. And the solution is now available to ours. Did you notice that after Jesus was, at, was through the wilderness piece, right at the very end, the trial of temptation, I mean, this was significant. We blow it off and we just like sit in this room and we can be unimpressed by that. But it was amazing what he had to endure. Did you notice that little phrase at the end of the passage? We sometimes overlook it, but there's this little phrase at the end of the passage where God sends the angels to take care of his boy. I love that. I absolutely love that. Can I get really weird on you for a moment? (laughs) Uh, I like to think that my God, I like to think about my heavenly father caring for me like that. Now, here's how I think about it. So it's wrong, but let's tell you how I think about it. 
I figure that God's aware of everything's going on in my life. He's my heavenly father, so when I'm with him, he's always aware. Just like I'm always aware when my kids are in the room. I'm always knowing what's happening. I can't help it. I'm just intrigued by them. I love them. They're the center of everything for me. So it's like I watch them. I'm just aware. And my heavenly father knows that about me. And he sees when I've had the rough week. He sees when we've had the rough time. He sees when we're going through that period in the desert or period in the wilderness. And I like to think of, my, of the heavenly father sort of sitting down there watching like this. And again, this time you're weird. And I like to think on the front here, he's got these rescue squad angels. <laughs> and so, like, they have, like, the little ambulance and little sirens or something. I don't know. But they all have this, like, I, I, I really, this is, you, you pray the way you want, I'm going to pray the way I want. And so I sort of think of them, like, having this bag, and they're ready. They're, like, just tracking, waiting to be turned loose. And God watches me walk through a trial. And he watches me grind through a difficult day. He watches me fight discouragement. He watches me fight the desire to leave to, for flight, like all of us do. He watches me and hears my cries. In fact, the scriptures say he keeps every tear in a vial. He watches that when I'm crying for my kid, crying for my spouse, crying for mom, for dad. And then there's a certain point when God says, okay, boys, go get them. You know, they come flying down. And like, oh, Tom, get up. Come on, come on, Tom, get up here. Here, have some food, have some food. You know, whatever it is, I just like to think that's what he does. And I think he does it in your life and mine. I do. I think he does that. You say, Tom, that's weird. Of course it's weird. But I don't care. That's what I think he does. You know why I think that? I've seen it. I've seen it in some of your lives. And I've certainly seen it in mine. Where people who live by the code, people who engage this and say, this is better than what's been in my heart to this point. Now here's what I've been doing this week. I tell you to give it a whirl. It's difficult for me to see the code in my own life. It is. But you know what? I can see it easy in yours. It's true, right? It's so much easier to see how unlike Jesus you are than it is to see how unlike Jesus I am, right? Isn't that true in your life too? Man, look at the way they live. But we can't see it in our own lives. That's the way people are. And that, that's kind of what church world does sometimes. But I've been listening to statements. I've been listening to things that cause people to be angry. I've been listening to evaluative statements, dialogue. And I've been identifying, is that coming from the code? Because if it's not, then it's coming from some other part of the heart. Right? And so what I've been praying this week, help me to live by the code. God, you're my father. You're my father. I love you. I need you in my life. You're not an option. You're not a cultural thing. You're my father. And you fill in all the blank spots of where we earthly fathers drop the ball. And not only you're my father, but you're a father who loves me. You love me. There's no reason for me to doubt myself or no reason for me to doubt how I feel in a given situation. You love me, and, you, and you're going to take care of me. God, Lord, it doesn't matter. Your scriptures say, yeah, this world, you know, it's going to stink sometimes. But, man, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even death, man, that doesn't bother you a lick. You're my heavenly Father, and you love me, and you're going to take care of me. And you're with me. You are with me. And Lord, I know this morning that there are many people in this room, along with this pastor, who need this code in our hearts and lives. So I want to encourage you to come right now. And if the period has to begin with some time of repentance, rethinking how we think about everything, maybe there's some times we've got to say, you know what? What's coming outside? I don't like it. I've got to rethink everything. And Lord, we turn from the way we're thinking about life, and we turn to the way you offer, the code you offer. You're my father. You love me, going to take care of me. 
and you're with me. And Lord, some of my friends in this room, some of the friends who are watching down at Pleasant View this morning, some friends in the chapel, what they need, they need you to release the rescue squad of angels. And they need you to send them, God. Send them. Send them with their medical bags. (laughs) Send them to cure emotions and addictions and disease and discouragement. Send them and heal them and turn problem to solution, regret to redemption, despair to hope. The people of the code in your name. Amen.